We can choose unilaterally to end a war that other people are waging against us because we decided it went on too long and that that won't have any consequences is really, I, I think, an unrealistic, an unrealistic way to proceed. It sent a, a, a general signal of, of uh, bad thinking, weakness, and irresolution. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, editor-in-chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. And you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Twenty years ago, in the aftermath of 9-11, Americans woke up to the reality of a world inhabited by Islamist terrorists who wanted to kill them. But two decades later, and after the sobering experience provided by inconclusive and ultimately unsuccessful wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, if there is anything that both parties seem to agree on these days, it is their desire to avoid foreign entanglements and especially violent conflicts in which America never seems interested in achieving victory. But the problem with foreign policy is that as much as Americans would like it to, the challenges don't go away. Even withdrawals that are inherently popular, like that from Afghanistan, can go so badly as to remind the country why they got into the conflict in the first place. Even as Americans obsess over a failing economy and are divided by partisan narratives, the question remains, what are the chief threats to the nation's security? Is it climate change, as the Biden administration and many of its allies insist, or should Americans also be focused on the consequences of the ongoing administration effort to return to a policy of appeasement of Iran and its nuclear ambitions? Or is the real peril facing the country a budding conflict with a rising communist power in China, which is challenging the U.S. on both the economic and military fronts? What does American defeat in Afghanistan at the hands of the Taliban portend for the future of Islamist terror groups? And will the Biden administration follow the example of past Democratic presidents and head down the rabbit hole of trying to entice the Palestinians into accepting a two-state solution that they don't want, and in pressuring Israel to make dangerous concessions? To discuss these issues, we're fortunate to have with us today someone who is not only a scholar with vast knowledge of foreign affairs in the Middle East, but also with experience in government. Douglas J. Fife is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, where he works on a range of foreign and defense issues, as well as writing and lecturing. He worked as a staffer to the legendary Senator Henry Scoop Jackson, then served in the National Security Council and the Department of Defense in the Reagan administration. He later served in the George W. Bush administration as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy from July 2001 to August 2005. He is the author of War and Decision, a memoir of his work on the Pentagon during the War on Terrorism. His writings on foreign and defense affairs have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, the Washington Post, Commentary, New Republic, as well as JNS. Doug Fife, welcome to Top Story. It's very good to be with you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks so much for being with us today. I want to start by asking you, what's your assessment of the negotiations that are going on right now between the Biden administration and Iran? The administration came into office determined to revive Barack Obama's weak nuclear deal, but to their surprise, they've discovered that Iran not only won't strengthen that agreement to actually ensure they won't get nuclear weapons, but are determined to force Biden's team of Obama alumni to agree to an even weaker version. Do you think the U.S. will stand its ground on the nuclear threat, or are we heading back towards a pact that will essentially ensure that Iran becomes, at the very least, a nuclear threshold state? I think that the, the news reports that have come out in just in the last few hours have suggested that uh, the Iranians are actually interested in concluding a deal. They've been putting out some, some uh, signals in favor of of the negotiations, which have raised some expectations that they might conclude a deal with the Biden team. I, I am personally not uh, an enthusiast for, for these negotiations. I think that the, the Iranians are 
committed to their nuclear program and are negotiating in such a way that they uh, they want to preserve their option to have a nuclear weapon. And they they saw that the Obama administration was weak in its negotiations. They think that the Biden team apparently is a continuation of that. And I think they may be right. Yeah, I, I think it's clear that Biden's team has learned little from the mistakes they made while serving Obama. You know, as a member of the Bush administration, which is both at the time and later much criticized for what people think or assume were its mistakes, what do you see as being behind this failure by the current administration to learn the same, learn any lessons from one of the past? Well, I think that in in the case of the of the Biden team, uh, many of the people who are doing the negotiations, I think, are just trying to vindicate the work that they had done in the in the Obama years. Um, I don't see a sign that President Biden himself is as uh, strategically or ideologically committed to the Iran deal uh, in the same way that President Obama was. Uh, but I think that that what you have is a instead of a strategic or an ideological commitment, as was the case in the Obama in the Obama administration. I think what you have with President Biden is just the political commitment. Because the Trump administration got out of the deal, Biden said we're going to get back in, and uh, I think it was a part of a of a grand scheme in the Obama years where. I think President Obama was really committed to the idea of redoing American Middle East policy based on a, a kind of a new partnership with Iran. I don't see that any indication that President Obama has that same kind of big picture ideological commitment to the Iran deal. But as I said, I think he's he got stuck in the negotiations and he has some enthusiasts on his uh, on his team that want to basically vindicate the work they did uh, previously. Yeah, turning um, slightly north uh, of that, uh, during your stint at the Pentagon, the war in Afghanistan began. Can you give us your thoughts on the disaster that unfolded last summer with the collapse of the Afghan government and the victory of the Taliban after Biden's precipitate withdrawal? Well, I think that a lot of the commentary about the... uh, the very poorly executed withdrawal from uh, of last summer has focused on the incompetence of uh, of the uh, of the actual mechanism for withdrawal i don't think that's the main problem i think that was a very serious problem but the main problem was the decision by the president to withdraw which I know, according to polls, was very popular throughout the United States, but I think it was it was misguided. The it was motivated by the idea about ending endless wars, and this was an idea that Trump endorsed, mm-hmm. and yeah. this was an idea that Biden endorsed. As I and said, I this seems to be a consensus. Yeah, that, that's right, and and I think that that uh, the, this the idea. That, that we can choose unilaterally to end a war that other people are waging against us because we decided it went on too long and that that won't have any consequences is really, I, I think, an unrealistic, an unrealistic way to proceed. The, the war on terror was, a, was, was not a war that we started um, as I like to point out, on, on 9-11, 9-11 was not the beginning of the war. It was the, it was the beginning of the recognition on the part of many Americans that we were at war. And there, there are people who considered themselves at war with us, and that's why the 9-11 occur, attack occurred. And it was clear that this was a different kind of war because we were fighting non-state actors and we were not going to have a clear-cut uh, you know, signing ceremony end to the war. And 
we were continuing to fight that war in Afghanistan. And, and then the Trump administration and then the Biden administration used this rhetoric of the need to end endless wars and decided that we were going to unilaterally pull out of the war. And our, you know, our enemies didn't, uh, didn't agree that the war was over. Mm -hmm. And so we pulled, we pulled out and they've continued to, uh, to do their thing. And, and that's why I think it's, it was such a disaster. And I mean, I, I do think that it's important to study why the actual mechanics of the withdrawal were, were screwed up. And that's important, but it's not as important as the broader uh, strategic point that we, we don't have it within our power to unilaterally end the war. We didn't unilaterally start the war. And right. the, our enemy has uh, something to say about both the beginning and the end. Yeah. What do you see as the main consequences of that disaster for both the Middle East, um, you know, the Arab states and Israel, as well as U.S. foreign policy? I think that the that the picture that emerged from that disaster is, is a picture of an administration that was eager to withdraw from the fight, was weak in its uh, general willingness to uh, defend and persist in defending uh, American interests and the interests of our partners. Uh, it sent a, a, a general signal of, of uh, bad thinking, weakness, and irresolution. Now, I think that that will m motivate both the Chinese and the Russians to want to see what advantages they can gain from an American administration that appears weak and confused and, and unwilling to use military power and eager to withdraw to an isolationist policy. We're seeing a test of that now from Putin. I, th I think we're, we, we've seen some tests of it over the last year from um, Xi Jinping and the way he's turned up military pressure on Hong Kong and Taiwan. And, um, and so I think we're inviting tests. And, and then these are dangerous tests. Yeah. Um, we don't know. These are things with unforeseen consequences. Um, as someone who is closely associated with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, who has been as much as anyone else uh, been subjected to a lot of harsh criticism for the criticism for the decisions that went into the starts of those conflicts. I'm sure you understand that the conventional wisdom today is that the failures there have created a situation in which there is little popular support for an assertive foreign policy in the Middle East or for involvement in conflicts, whether against terror regimes or a rogue regime like Iran. Do you think that's fair? And how can any administration um, now or in the future revive support for a strong foreign policy absent some new disaster like, God forbid, another 9-11? I mean, is there any other option other than waiting for Americans to wake up? Well, I, I think that there is fairness in the, in the criticism that the, the fact that the Iraq war in particular didn't go well. Mm -hmm. and was a lot longer and uh, and bloodier and not as well focused as it should have been and as people expected it to be, that has enormous consequences. And I think that the, uh, I think that, that President Obama's elections and for that matter, President Trump's election were in part a, a, reaction by the public to the unhappiness that was uh, was felt uh, about the, in particular, the Iraq war. And so, you know, when you're not, <clears throat> when you don't do a war well and when it's not successful, there are consequences. And the consequences is, you know, are, 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 the consequences are that you get the, the kind of reaction that we've gotten. And it's, uh, I think it's been hurting the country. And you're quite right that at the moment you have a lot of political support for the kind of weak 
rhetoric and and policies that we saw both in the Trump administration and in the Biden administration, where there's this remarkable um, continuity on uh, isolationist policies. And um, and I think that that uh, you're right, as long as we have this this broad based support for weak policies, we're going to be inviting challenges at some point. I think we're going to have to rise to the challenge and that could change the political picture in the United States, but it could be a very dangerous circumstance. Yeah, it's only terrible things that will you know, create a sea change in opinion about foreign policy, it seems to me. And I think that's it's actually sort of a trend, you know, that in American history, Americans always like to forget about the rest of the world, but the rest of the world doesn't forget about them. Um, switching to... Um, another part of the Middle East, given that Biden is eager to walk back the stands of the Trump administration on anything, uh, whether it concerns Iran or support for Israel, but is also wary of expending political capital for no reason, since the Palestinians clearly are uninterested in peace. Where do you see the Biden administration heading on on that front with its Middle East policies? I think that the we may actually have gotten to the uh, to the point where, with the handful of a few um, a few really intense uh, proponents of of Arab Israeli peace negotiations, and um, and I think these are people who are in in some ways vestiges of. Of, of a long history of American support mm. for that for that kind of diplomacy, I think we've gotten to the point where there is a general recognition that until the something is done to improve the quality of Palestinian leadership, the prospects for any kind of constructive result from an American diplomatic initiative on the Arab-Israeli conflict on the Palestinian issue, uh, the prospects are very dim. And and so I think that your question was correct when you highlighted the reluctance of the Biden administration to invest political capital in something that it's it, it knows is almost inevitably going to produce nothing but loss. And um, <clears throat> and so I don't think I, I don't think that the administration has so far has shown any serious inclination to make a big diplomatic investment. What they have done is they've revived U.S. aid to the Palestinians so that if somebody says that the lack of diplomacy shows an indifference to the Palestinians, the administration could say, we're not indifferent, we're throwing money at them. But the... um, I don't think that anybody in the administration in in, uh, in the most senior levels believes that if they uh, if they revive intense peace diplomacy, they're going to they're going to have anything good to show for it at the moment. It, that's a pretty uh, that's a, a pretty dead issue. Yeah, that's true. I don't see, you know, and Ant- Blinken trying, you know, uh, uh, doing the same thing as uh, Kerry and trying to revive peace talks that will will fail, but they are sort of nibbling away at the edges um, with policy in Jerusalem, with their interest in reopening a, a, a consulate to the Palestinians in Jerusalem, even though they're not moving the embassy back to Tel Aviv. Um, do you see that and sort of these funding issues as having the the potential to... Uh, start a uh, start a, a you know a dispute that they can't really control. I think what the administration is doing is unconstructive. I, mm-hmm. I think that it is it is out of ideas. They I think they they would be happy to revive peace diplomacy, but they do recognize, as I said, that it's not it's not going to go anywhere given the nature of the Palestinian leadership right now. And and so what they're trying to do is be able to answer the the standard kind of pressure that comes on American officials when they have meetings around the world. And in some places, people ask them, well, what are you doing to resolve the Israel-Palestinian matter? So they want to have 
some talking points. And so they say, well, we, we're doing this and we're doing that and we're providing money and we're supporting this program and, and the like. I think what they're doing, though, is unconstructive because if someone were actually in the administration interested in doing something that increases the possibility of some kind of diplomatic progress toward peace, we would have a strategy for changing the Palestinian political and economic landscape mm -hmm. so that you could get new and better leadership. And the way to do that was opened up by the Abraham Accords. And if the administration were really smart, it would be working with the UAE and the Bahrainis and the Saudis and the Egyptians and finding out what could they do that we could support working together with them and with Israel to try to promote a new and better Palestinian leadership that's actually interested in improving the quality of life for the Palestinians um, and not uh, perpetuating the conflict with Israel. Yeah, uh, I think that's true. And uh, they don't seem to be that interested in, in, in doing that. Um, speaking of conflict, the one area where conflict uh, seems to be a, a real possibility is between the United States and Israel over Iran. Um, obviously, for Israel, Iran and its nuclear ambitions is an existential issue. It's an issue on which there is a complete consensus across the political spectrum. But clearly, that's not um, the perspective of the Biden administration. And if, as you said earlier, there's about to be a new agreement, which is likely, um, you know, at, at best, it would be as weak as the 2015 agreement, uh, but likely weaker. Um, that creates the possibility of some real conflict with Israel it's because, you know, Israel is going to act in some ways when one anticipates Israel will act in some ways to deal with Iran's ambitions that the um, that Washington isn't going to like. I mean, where does that head? That may be I I when you say Washington, I, I think there are. There are various views and seem to be even within the administration various views on the on the Iran problem. And I don't think that everybody in the administration is an enthusiast for this uh, for these negotiations. And it's possible that there are people who understand the reality of what you said, which is that the Israelis, if they really believe that the Iranians are moving quickly to the uh, to the red line mm -hmm. on nuclear weapons that the Israelis are going to take action and the and various Israeli officials in in recent months have been speaking with amazing bluntness mm -hmm. um, about a military threat to Iran and I think that everybody should take that seriously I, I think the Israelis mean it yeah. and uh, and you're right that there are some people in the administration who would oppose that strongly. But I imagine that there are probably some people in the administration that would uh, would would be understanding. Uh -huh. um, and uh, and I, I even wonder whether there I mean, I, one would hope that there are people in the administration who are talking in a serious fashion to the Israelis to make sure that. If diplomacy fails, the Israelis and the Americans together can mm -hmm. somehow cooperate on what needs to be done militarily. And, um, and so I think that, that th this is something that, that uh, the Iranians should worry about. And I think part of the reason that the Americans, I would hope, would be working with the Israelis on contingencies is... Because if even the people who really believe that diplomacy has a chance of solving this problem with the Iranians uh, should understand that if the, our diplomacy, the U.S. diplomacy, is not backed by some kind of serious military threat, the diplomatic prospects are zero. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, I think that... that you're quite right to call attention to the Israeli threat. I'm not sure that it's 
only an Israeli threat. One would hope that the threat would be from Israel and the United States in some kind of cooperation. And, um, and, with, the, and with the cooperation of uh, Israel's uh, new diplomatic partners in the Arab world as well, who are well, as much, if not more, afraid of Iran than Israel is. Yeah, I'm not. I don't know how much cooperation you'd have with them, but you would certainly, I think, have a cheering section. <laughs> and um, I think that the 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 Gulf Arabs tend to be rather timid uh, from a security point of view, and um, I think they're very happy when the Israelis are tough. But I'm not sure that they necessarily want to um, actively cooperate in a you know, in an Israeli military action against Iran. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, Doug, you're someone with some historical perspective after getting your start in public policy as far back as the 1970s, but let's restrict our view to the last 20 years. Um, While the mainstream press has adopted narratives that tend to demonize Republican presidents and lionize Democrats, how do you think history will ultimately treat the last uh, three administrations under Bush, Obama, and Trump when it comes to foreign policy? Oh, it's a, that's a complex, <laughs> that's a complex picture. And uh, I, I think that, I think I would go back to the, to the comment that I made earlier, which is I think that the Bush administration did a lot of things that were necessary to do, but it didn't, it didn't do them that successfully. Mm-hmm. I think I mean, my basic view on the Iraq war, for example, is I think the president made the right decision to oust the Saddam Hussein regime based on what he knew and, and, uh, at the time. But the war wasn't, wasn't executed as it should have been. And I think that we, I think we messed up the political transition in Iraq and we had a, a, two prolonged a U.S.-led occupation, and we made other errors. And the consequence of those errors was to create a backlash. And we're still living with the backlash. And in the same way that a lot of American policy throughout the 70s and 80s was damaged by the no more Vietnam's mantra, uh, I think we have the, you know, no more George W. Bush, no more wars in the Middle East, no more war on terror kind of mantras that we're now living with. And they're uh, they're signaling to the world a kind of irresolution, unwillingness to use military power, weakness. And uh, as I said, we're, we're seeing consequences of that in the increasing boldness of both, uh, well, of of China, Russia, and Iran, mm-hmm. and um, and I worry about that. Yeah, um, obviously uh, we go through cycles with uh, administrations, and you know that, that's sort of an American thing that we do. Uh, we always think that foreign policy is over, and then we get uh, awake, awakened to uh, to new challenges. Um, and I guess that's uh, where we'll have to leave it in terms of where Biden is going to go with that uh, w- with these challenges. Um, Doug, I want to thank you so much for your insight and perspective. I want to thank you for your time, and we also want to thank our audience. Whether you're listening to us on Spotify or any of the other podcast platforms or watching us on the JNS YouTube channel or on JBS TV, please like and or subscribe to Top Stories. Give us good reviews. Please let us know where you listen and watch the show and what you think about it. And we'll see you next week.